fresh meat. Going to get some sleep tonight if it kills me. Guys and gals, I've been waiting to do this movie ever since this series started. There are few films as influential on the horror world than this wonderful venture from Wes Craven. The killer at the lead has haunted many a dream, including my own, and provided more iconic moments than I even care to count. So join us as we talk about the man of your dreams as we cover A Nightmare on Elm Street on today's Real Slashers. Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. The story of A Nightmare on Elm Street is one of my favorites in all of cinema. There are few journeys in film that connect deeper than Nancy Thompson's struggle to find out what's happening to her and her friends, all while the ticking time bomb of eventual sleep becomes the death of her. The opening scene of Freddy building his trademark glove is a masterclass in how to set up a terrifying villain. We're shown what he kills with, and these little noises emanate from him that just signal what bad news he is. Add to that the awkward framing as the credits roll, and it just further sets up the motif that Craven plays with constantly throughout the film. Is this a dream, or is this real life? And sure, there are clues that give you an indication, so it's never some huge mystery, but it makes it so the film can seamlessly transition from ordinary to the extraordinary without much setup needing to happen. As Tina walks through this boiler room, we finally get our first glimpse at Freddy, who startles Tina awake. The cuts along her nightgown tell us all we need to know. Whatever happens in your dream happens in reality. This all comes in the opening minutes of this film, and it sets up everything. What follows is a journey unlike any other, because we watch Tina and her eventual murder by Freddy. Tina's friend Nancy is our actual lead, and she's got a pretty big shell to break out of. Then her own house. But we'll get into that later. This misdirect of starting out with Tina and then switching over to Nancy feels very Marion Crane and Psycho, and leaves you with an uneasy feeling for the rest of the movie. We've already lost one lead. What's to prevent Freddy from killing Nancy out of nowhere and then suddenly just switch to Glenn's perspective? That's Johnny Depp, by the way. The switcheroo sets up the audience expectation that anything can happen, and that keeps you on the edge of your seat for the rest of the movie. Nancy watches as her friends die around her, and she's left to figure out the mystery before Kruger kills her too. Yeah, sure, I'm simplifying it a ton, but you've all seen Elm Street, and I don't want to walk you through this step by step. Everyone has seen this movie, and if you haven't, shame on you. Also, we're no longer friends. So really, I just want to focus on some of the more interesting aspects of the plot. The common theme present throughout Elm Street is the sins of the parent being felt by their innocent children. Nancy and her friends don't deserve any of this. I mean, sure, there's probably not anyone that deserves this, but Freddy should probably at least focus on the actual people that hurt him rather than their kids. Really shows how fucked in the head he is. Not that I expected sanity from a guy who murders children, but still. Hell, once Nancy's mom even somewhat believes her, she does something crazy and puts gates and locks all over the doors and windows of the house. Talk about overcompensating for guilt. Mother! And that's not even getting into her alcoholism. This lady hides vodka bottles, and she's a single mother. Oh, and just for a little fun fact, you can see Evil Dead playing on Nancy's TV at one point in the movie. And this was actually a pretty cool direct response to Sam Raimi, who also included a Hills Have Eyes poster in his film. Gotta love when films do these little winks to each other. The ending is brilliant, but it certainly hasn't aged well. 
Unless Mrs. Thompson has the ability to turn herself into a plastic blow-up doll. Because then I'll shut my mouth. But as is, it really takes you out of the moment. Almost makes you wish they had just gone with Craven's original ending, where Nancy is reunited with her friends and they drive off for their school day. No Freddy appearance at all. But is this a dream? Is Nancy dead and just back with her friends in the afterlife? It's a much more thought-provoking ending, but also puts more of a kibosh on future sequels. At least, we didn't get what Bob Shea originally wanted with Freddy literally driving the car. Because, no. Just no. Please, God. This is God. Freddy certainly was a star, kind of the father figure who takes delight in killing innocents and delights in evil. There are few killers who have haunted more dreams than Freddy Krueger. And I mean, I suppose that's a given, but the dream demon's power of attacking you while you're asleep is something that can really haunt you to your core. Unlike Camp Crystal Lake or even Haddonfield, Illinois, Freddy's location isn't exactly something you can avoid. Everyone must sleep. Therefore, everyone must enter his domain eventually. As I already touched on a little, Kruger gets one of the greatest character introductions ever. How Craven plays with what you see versus what you don't really allows the imagination to run wild when it comes to Fred. Kruger's trademark red and green sweater was chosen by Craven due to the psychological effect the colors have on the psyche when they're paired together. It's something viewers wouldn't outright notice, but instead be overcome with uneasiness just at the sight of him. That's just brilliant. Even the name, Fred Krueger, it just sounds so much like a villain. Craven took this from his own childhood because his childhood bully was actually named Fred Krueger. His appearance comes from a homeless man that terrified Craven when he was younger. So the fact that Kruger has these real-life origins to pull from, it almost makes him feel a little more layered. Then there's Robert England, who completely embodies the role of Freddy Krueger, so spectacularly that he became a pop culture phenomenon. Sure, his appearance here is much more subdued than what he turns into in the sequels, but it leaves an even bigger impact. While a slew of imitators have come since, there was no one like him at the time. He toyed with his victims using their own nightmares and psychologically broke them down before finally dispatching of them. Freddy takes mental warfare up to 11. Now every single one of Freddy's kills here are so damn memorable. The ceiling crawl, the bed geyser, even Nancy's mom floating on the bed. All these moments will remain with you well after the credits roll. Because Craven sets the stage perfectly to help separate what Kruger provides that's so different from his colleagues Michael and Jason. And that's creative kills. They are bound by reality, but Freddy can do whatever his imagination can come up with. And apparently he really has a thing for goats. Miss Nude America is going to be on tonight. Well, how can you hear what she's going to say? Who cares what she says? I'm sure that most people who grew up on this series also had some kind of crush on Nancy Thompson. She is the epitome of strength and ingenuity, and truly takes on an impossible situation with pure inner strength. And I mean, just look at her. She's beautiful. Since she's our final girl, we can't possibly see any nudity from her. But there is something during the iconic bath scene that will make you go, wait, was I supposed to see that? But don't worry, purist, that's a body double, not Langenkamp. There's also Tina, played by Amanda Weiss, who is really cute, but her decision making leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, what on earth does she see in Rod? After her initial nightmare, we were able to see Tina's mom isn't exactly the best example of how a strong, independent woman should be. But it still makes you want to scream at your TV when you see Rob being a scumbag. But he's clearly good at something. Morality sucks. Johnny Depp appears in his first film role as Glenn, Nancy's boyfriend. I've lost count of the number of times I've heard some girl swoon over Depp in this film. He's what you would think of when you hear boy next door type. 
Pretty much the entire opposite is Rob, who seems to constantly have a layer of sweat going. He almost looks glazed, for God's sake. Hey, up yours with a twirling lawnmower. Okay, fine. You'll always be a legend because you gave us that insult. Oh, he scraped his fingernails along things. Actually, they were more like finger knives or something. Something he'd made himself. Nancy, you dreamed about the same creep I did. There are few moments as iconic in the world of horror than Tina's death in this film. Sure, you could go for Glenn's death just for the pure gross out factor, but what happens here is unparalleled. At this point in the movie, we've spent most of our time with Tina. Sure, Nancy and Glenn have been introduced, but we start with Tina and it really feels like she's the person that we're going to be spending the rest of the movie with. After getting hot and heavy in the bedroom, Tina and Rod sleep soundly until someone starts throwing rocks at the window. Tina investigates the noise, but Rod doesn't show any interest whatsoever, even when she tries waking him up. And you may just be screaming at Tina to realize she's in a dream, but how many times have you not realized you were in a dream, no matter how insane it's gotten? Because I've done that plenty. Lured outside, Tina makes her way out to the alleyway. That's when we're introduced to the disturbing imagery of Kruger's outstretched arms. Again, it's the imagery that says so much. No matter where you try to run, Freddy will catch you. And catch her he does. But not before playing some sadistic games first. Freddy takes some kind of sick joy in this, as if the more he toys with his victims, the sweeter the kill will be. When we're finally thrown back to the real world, we get to see Tina writhing in agony as Rod looks on, not knowing what's happening. This is when the truly unbelievable happens, and we're treated to this brilliant camera effect of Tina crawling up on the ceiling, while Rod just stares helplessly from the floor. By the time Freddy makes his final strike, Tina's body slumps and falls to the bed. <laughs> The splattering sound it makes while Rod gets splashed with blood really nails in the point that Tina is not making it out of this one. This is about as final as you can get. It also shows the chaos that will follow and how Kruger's greatest strength is that no one will believe those he terrorizes. They're entirely on their own. I just asked you to do one thing. Just stay awake and watch me. Just wake me up if it looked like I was having a bad dream. And what did you do? You shit. You fell asleep. A Nightmare on Elm Street released on November 9th, 1984. While New Line Cinema dealt with the US release, Palace Pictures actually helped with distribution in the UK. The film only initially released in 165 cinemas but it still managed to rake in nearly 1.3 million on opening weekend. Word of mouth spread, and before you knew it, Freddy was haunting the dreams of people worldwide and bringing in a total of 57 million. It was a bona fide success. While Craven already had big cult hits like The Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes, Elm Street really cemented his name in Hollywood. The creative ingenuity involved showed he was more than just some exploitation director and could actually provide a thought-provoking horror film. But his interest in continuing the character was almost non-existent. Thankfully for fans of what was to follow, New Line Cinema's Bob Shea owned the sequel rights and when he looked at Kruger, he just saw dollar signs. Freddy Krueger became a massive pop culture phenomenon with multiple sequels, as well as his own television show and video game. Everywhere you turned in the 80s, there he was. Robert England has gone on to plenty of success in the horror world, even though fans are always clamoring for him to return to the role of Kruger. There's also a great documentary out there called I Am Nancy that shows just how much the role of Nancy and its attention brought to Heather Langenkamp. I don't think we even need to get into how Johnny Depp's life has gone. Up and down, to say the least. While Wes Craven has always regretted not having full creative control over the sequels, which he wouldn't have done in the first place, he was at least able to poke fun at it and scream. I like that movie. It was scary. 
Wow, well, the first one was, but the rest suck. Wait, doesn't New Nightmare fall into that category? Huh. There have been rumors of another remake, but after what happened last time, it rightfully hasn't been the easiest thing to get greenlit. Even Elijah Wood, who has shown interest in rebooting the series, and produced quite a few fantastic horror films of his own, has had trouble getting it made. While it's unlikely that Robert England will ever be mashed in terms of performance, roles like the Joker have proven that the world is big enough for multiple interpretations of a character. Let's just hope they do their due diligence when it comes to casting, and we aren't stuck with another terrible nightmare. Wes Craven's 1984 classic isn't a film you watch just once or twice. No, 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 no. It's an annual rewatch that gets better and better the more times you see it. The story is so well crafted, and the characters are so believable that you want to go on this crazy roller coaster ride every time the opportunity comes up. Because no matter how many slashers spring up, there is only one Freddy Krueger, and he'll always be the man of your dreams. Come to Freddy's.